When Claudette and I uh, were first pastoring in Victoria, British Columbia many years ago, this was back in the 70s, there was a, a lady who came to the church named Louise and uh, Louise and her family came from a very strong Catholic background, French Catholic background. And uh, Louise got wonderfully saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and her kids came along and they did too. And uh, one day her uh, uncle came to uh, a Friday night service and his name was Michael Hogan. And uh, Michael was a, an old man, a really nice guy, an elderly gentleman that lived all by himself as kind of a caretaker of a, an uh, apartment building. And his room was basically the boiler room. So he, he had a bed down in the boiler room and it was a very small room and he lived very frugally and he was just a very quiet man. But he came to church and, and gave his heart to Jesus Christ and it was just wonderful what happened to him. Uh, and his one joy in life before he came to our service was to smoke. That was the one pleasure that he got in life. He didn't really have any hobbies or anything, but he smoked and he smoked religiously 42 years. He was a very dedicated smoker. And that's basically all he had to do all day, so he just kind of sat around and smoked. And uh, Michael came to the service, and I didn't know this about him. I mean, I could smell that he was a smoker, but I didn't know how committed he really was. But uh, it wasn't really just much more than a, a few weeks after he started coming and gave his life to the Lord that uh, he called me one night. I think it was even on a Friday night, um, but he called me and he said to me, he was just a man of few words, so he just sort of spoke very quietly. And he said, uh, I just wanted to tell you, he said, I've been a smoker for 42 years. And he said, it's not that I don't like it, but he said, it's just I don't want to do it anymore. And I said, right. I said, well, most addicts are like that. It's not like they want to quit. They just want to be a non-smoker, but nobody wants to quit, you know. Um, and he says, I went to bed last night and I just said, Lord, I really like smoking, but I really don't want to do it anymore. And uh, he said, I woke up the next day and I've not wanted another cigarette. And he said, you got to understand, I've been smoking for 42 years. And I said, Michael, I'm just so happy for you. He said, yeah, it's an amazing love. That's all he said. It's an amazing love. The title of my message tonight is Amazing Love amazing love and I want you to take a look at first Peter chapter 1 verse 1 I want to talk to you tonight about this amazing love it really is amazing and I'm going to show you why it's so amazing and how it affects you first Peter chapter 1 verse 1 amazing love first Peter chapter 1 verse 1 Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus Galatia Cappadocia Asia and Bithynia elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ grace to you and peace be multiplied blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again that's born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I want to talk to you about amazing love. Peter said... The genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. The genuineness of your faith. He's not talking about whether you're faking it. You know, are you really genuine in your faith? He's talking actually, the old King James says the trial of your faith. 
What he's talking about is how gold is tested. They heat up gold and they heat it and heat it to great temperatures to burn off the dross or to burn off what's not pure in the gold. But gold can only handle so much heat and it's a testing by fire. And this is what he speaks of. He says that your faith, the genuineness, the purity of it, when it's heated up, it's more precious than gold. That means it doesn't fall apart, it doesn't disintegrate. Your faith he's talking about. So when gold is tested, it's heated up in fire. And sometimes faith is tested as by fire. Now look at chapter 4, verse 12. Chapter 4, verse 12. We'll come back here to where we just were in a moment. Chapter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Now, of course... I've explained to you before that I believe he's speaking specifically about what Nero was doing to the Christians because it was Nero that wanted Peter killed and had him crucified. But just before he was crucified, Nero was going around gathering up Christians, strapping them to long poles, pouring tar on them while they were still alive, and lighting them on fire as torches in his garden parties. And uh, that's how he lit up some of his parties. This is well documented that he did this. And so he says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Sounds pretty strange to me. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. I want to show you that faith is more valuable than gold, and genuine faith is indestructible. The real tested faith is indestructible. You can't stop it. Can you imagine those people getting up on those poles being lit on fire? I wonder how many of them said, okay, hang on a second. I think I'm willing to reconsider that church that I go to. I, okay, I don't really seriously believe that stuff, okay? I was just kind of doing it because my mom and dad told me to do it. Now, I, I think that they willingly went and he speaks about this as being a testing that showed the genuineness or purity of their faith. Now, I don't think that's going to happen to you or I. I mean, we don't go through any of the kind of persecution they went through, thank God. So ours is mostly in forms of taxation. <laughs> but you know, there is some persecution that's going around these days, and uh, fewer of us are, are respected for our Christian belief. But verse, uh, let's go back to uh, chapter 1, verse 8 now. Because verse 8 says something about why we have this indestructible faith. Why is this faith so powerful? You know, fire's not going to stop it. A testing, a problem's not going to stop it. And when Jesus appears, it'll bring glory to his name. But why is this faith? Why do we have this indestructible faith? Verse 8, speaking of Jesus, whom having not seen, you love. Now this is an amazing love that you love him so much yet you've never seen him I think this is a very amazing love just look around the room for a moment just go ahead and look around at everybody that's here tonight here you see people sitting in a room on a Friday night when they could be doing lots of other things and they're communicating with someone they've never seen in fact if people came to meet him they wouldn't see him here yet we love him and talk to him as if he's a person that's visible. I find this quite interesting. You're either crazy or you're in love with him. And this is an amazing love. You've never seen him. How amazing is that? That you love him though you've never met him. It's an amazing love. It's love so strong that your faith can defy the flames because you see faith worketh by love. Faith worketh by love. So, whom having not seen you love. You know, this love is so powerful that you'll let go of something or someone that you can see in order to take hold of something or someone you can't see. Let me say it again. Amazing love is so powerful that you'll let go of something or someone that you can see in order to take hold of something or someone that you can't see. 
That's an amazing love. I find that that's an amazing love. It defies the laws of gravity. That you would let go of something or someone that you can see, it's tangible, in order to take hold of something and someone that you can't see. Now listen, this is where people lose their faith. This is where people fall away from God. It's because they become so drawn to what they can see, to people and things, people and things, people and things, people and things. And they're drawn to it. They can see it. But there's an amazing love that says, I'll let it all go. Even people, even things, I'll let it all go because of someone and something I can't see. You know, I've never seen heaven. I've read books of people that have been there. They say different things about it. I don't know exactly what to believe except for what I read in the Bible. All I know is that it's a really neat place. I feel like I've been there, but I've never been there. I feel like I'm a citizen of there, and I really am a citizen of heaven, and so are you, but we've never been there. This is what happened when the Israelites were in captivity. Uh, you may remember in the book of Daniel, you don't have to go there, but King Nebuchadnezzar tried to get the uh, Hebrew boys to worship a false god that they could see made of gold. It was a huge statue. It was made of gold, which is destructible. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, now if you're ready at the time, you, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. No comment. <laughs> If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. These men had never seen God. But you know, you don't get the sense at all that they had a little sidebar meeting. Just a second, Neb, I'll get right back to you. Guys, what do you think? I don't know, I really hate to burn. You know, I just bought this, these slacks and I really don't want to ruin them. You know, I hate the smell of smoke. Doesn't that bother you? You know, there seemed to be no pause in their thinking. It was, well, there's no answer to give you. Sorry. Because you see, our God, who, by the way, we've never seen, is going to rescue us out of this fiery furnace. They loved him so much that their love for him released faith. Faith worketh by love. And they knew that they would pass the test of fire. Now, this is what Peter said, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revealing of Jesus Christ. This is an amazing love. I think it's an amazing love that you and I have because you haven't seen him, yet you live as if you have. You've never been to heaven, but you live as if you have. You love him with such a powerful love that you'll let go of something or someone that you can see in order to take hold of something or someone that you can't see. This is how the saints of old lived. They lived like this too. Whenever I look at some of the old saints of the Old Testament, you see they live like that. They didn't even have what you and I have. They didn't have that spiritual connection with them. And they lived like this. They set their sights and their heart on another world and they live like it. It's an amazing thing. Go to Hebrews 11.13. I'll show you how they did it. Hebrews 11.13. It's an amazing love that these people exhibited. I believe it's possible for you and I to have this kind of love. And this love is so strong that it will compel us to tell other people about Jesus. It'll give us answers when there are questions. It will cause us to be confident when everyone around us is shaking. Hebrews 11:13. Paul wrote, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. That doesn't sound too encouraging, does it? Well, praise the Lord, Pastor, I just want to die in faith, never having received the promises, just like those guys. Uh, let me explain. They didn't receive the promises for a reason. They didn't receive it because these promises were for our day, not for their day. So it wasn't that they didn't have enough faith or the faith doesn't work. It's they had their eyes set on a promise of the Scriptures that was for our day. It was the coming of the Messiah, the church age, the age of grace, 
All of those things, that's what they were believing for. They listened to the prophets and believed it. So they died not having received it because it was for our day. But he goes on to say, having seen the promises afar off, they were assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. See, they're looking for somewhere else. And truly, if they'd called to mind that country that they came out of, they would have had an opportunity to go back. It's true. At a certain point, these people became strangers. One translation says aliens. They became aliens. They said, this is not where I'm from. Of course you are, Bob. You grew up here. You're from Embro. Deal with it. But, but you know, they started saying, this is not my final place. This is not my home. I have my sights set on something else. You're moving to Tilsonburg. No, no, I have my sights set on something else. There's something more to my life than what I'm doing right now. See, and they set their heart on it and they embraced it. And they started confessing things like, I'm not from here. They started talking like that. They'd say, well, actually, I belong to God. I'm not like everybody else. They started talking like that. A little strange, not really. Pretty normal when you have this amazing love for someone and something that you cannot see. The moment you start living this way, you start seeing yourself differently. You call yourself something else. You feel like there's more to life than what you're living right now. The moment you start living like this, there's no way you could go back. And not only that, you don't see your present circumstances as permanent because your sights are set on something else. Uh, look at verse 16 here while we're in Hebrews. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The moment you and I start living this way, you might have both feet here, but your heart is set on something else and someone else. And you've never seen it, and you love it. It's an amazing love. It's an amazing love. Brothers and sisters, this love ought to get so strong over the years that you find you'd rather be there than here. You know, there are days I feel that way, but you don't necessarily feel that way all the time. And you know, I like my life. I'm not in any rush to give up this wonderful life I have. I love this life. However, as you get older, you more and more find your love ought to grow for him until you just want to be around him more. And this amazing love is what drives you to prayer times. It's what drives you to spend time with him. It's what makes you come to church. It's an amazing love. I want you to look together at a passage in Luke 7, verse 36. Luke 7, verse 36. I want you to see two people who have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. They saw him face to face. One of them had a formal relationship. The other had a personal one. Luke 7, 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner... When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, they didn't sit in chairs when they sat at tables. They were actually reclining. They would have cushions, and they would sort of lay down on the side, and they would recline on the cushion and eat and so their feet would go up behind them and she came in behind because the food is in front and she began to weep and she began to pour the contents of this alabaster container over him and this was, woman was a prostitute so this was not very appropriate when the Pharisee verse 39 who had invited him saw this he spoke to himself not to anyone else he just thought this Oh, if this man were a prophet, he'd know what manner of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. And Jesus began to speak, and he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And, the, and he said, Teacher, uh, say it, whatever it is you want to say. <laughs> if only he knew Jesus had been reading his mind. Uh, he would have said, I'm sorry, I have to get up and go to the washroom right now. I'll be back later. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor, Jesus said, who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, 
and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you've rightly judged. There's something about this amazing love that sets it apart from just any other kind of love. This love is so amazing because when you realize what you were and you realize what you had and you realize what you should have been and you realize what you could have been and you realize what you have become and you realize what price was paid for you to become it and you realize what love was given that got all that you have even when you didn't know him then you start to live differently than other people but when you don't see those things and you don't realize those things you just say yeah I'm a Christian I go to church I go to that church and I'm a Christian and, and that's basically it yeah but no this is different Simon had a reason to love Jesus like this woman did Simon could have loved Jesus as intensely as this woman did why because there's very good reason to believe that Simon was the leper that had been healed by Jesus. There was another case in Matthew's gospel where he went to the home of Simon the leper and the same thing happened. So I have reason to believe this is Luke's account of the same story. This was a man who used to have leprosy. Now he's healed. And now he's inviting Jesus to his house to celebrate. And he's looking at a woman who's been sinning and he said... Jesus shouldn't be allowing her to do that. But Jesus said, listen, this woman's been forgiven much. Verse 44, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman hasn't ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Wow, that's a powerful statement. I want you to see the multitude of her sins were no match for her amazing love. Do you see that? It didn't matter how many sins she had. It was her amazing love that vetoed them all. This is powerful, because I know he loves me and forgives me. But oh, how powerful it is when I love him with a passionate love, an amazing love, and it vetoes all my sins. Praise God. Verse 49, and those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Faith worketh by love. Do you see? She gave an amazing love to the Lord and faith was released and Jesus said your faith has saved you faith works by love it's possible that faith is hindered by love it's possible if faith worketh by love it could be hindered by love what do you mean well it's possible that this amazing love could be shut down and cause faith to be shut down is it possible that sometimes our faith does not operate properly and doesn't produce results because there's no amazing love. Faith worketh by love. Do you love the Lord? Yes, I love the Lord. But do you have an amazing love for the Lord? Don't answer that. But do you have an amazing love? A love that says, Lord, above everything, I'm passionately in pursuit of you. Yeah, I get busy at times, but I am in pursuit of you. Is it possible that your faith is not operational because you haven't been operating in this amazing love. I believe the answer to the question is yes. I believe it is possible that faith is hindered not because you don't believe God or don't believe the Bible, but because you're not walking in an amazing love toward Him. Now, this is something very, very powerful. This is why amazing love is not an inspirational thought. It's a life and death thought. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and see a sentence that is, I think, as big as a billboard in my spirit these days. 
1 Peter 1 8. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. I want to read it again. This is a, uh, this is a big sentence here. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. Hang on to this now. Let me explain it. Though now you do not see him. Though now you do not see him. This sentence is like a big billboard in my spirit. Though now you do not see him. Think about that sentence. Though now you do not see him. What does that tell us? That tells us that right now we're in a season of our life where we don't see him but it's possible for something to happen now without seeing him. Think about this. Do you know this is how you extract truth from the word? If you want to know how to get the word to talk to you, don't just read it like you're reading the newspaper. Stop every now and then and just read sentences over and over and over again. This is how I do it. One of the ways I do it is I'll, st I'll take a sentence when my spirit is arrested and I'll just start saying it out loud. Though now you do not see him. And if you could see my notes, I have now in capital letters and underlined. Though now you do not see him. Pastor, why is this so big? Now is a very important time. Because what goes on right now, right now in your life is what makes amazing love so amazing. The Bible says, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing. Though now you don't see him, you believe. Believing is what amazing love allows you to do. Listen carefully to me now as I explain this to you. Now you don't see him. What makes this amazing love so amazing is you love him though you can't see him. And what happens when you love him now? It allows you to believe. Though now you don't see him, yet believing. Look at this. You don't have any evidence other than the love that's in your spirit. You don't have any physical proof, but you have his word, and you have this amazing love for him, so that now, even though you can't see him, the love makes you a believer. The Bible says, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice. I'm about to show you a great truth. Though now you don't see him, you believe. Yet believing, you rejoice. What goes on between not seeing and receiving? What goes on between believing it, even though you can't see it, and actually receiving it? What goes on in the now when you can't see it up to the time that you can see it? Listen to this now. Jesus is coming and I can't see him. The day is coming when he'll appear and I'll get caught up and see him. I'll meet him in the air and I'll be with him and so will you. I trust you'll be with me when we go. At that time, I'll see him face to face and one of the things I'll discover when I see him is that I'm like him. That's what 1 John 3 says. You shall see him face to face and you shall see him as he is for you shall be like him. Okay, so the day is coming. I love him now. I can't imagine loving him anymore, but I will. I don't think I need to see him to love him. The day's coming when I'm going to see him, but I love him now. So what goes on between now, when I can't see him, and when I do see him, rejoicing? Do you see this in the verse? Though now, boy, you just take that sentence and just wring everything out of it. Though now you can't see him, yet believing. What do you do right now when you can't see? You believe. And believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This is why I don't know how I could be any happier when I see him face to face. 
because I'm already having joy that I can't describe. I'm having feelings for God that I can't teach you about. How do you teach somebody to feel this way? Right now, see now is an important time because now I can't see. But I believe and therefore I start rejoicing. Now think of anything that you believe has been promised to you that you cannot now see. But because of the amazing love you have for him, you believe and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. What goes on now is very important because when you see him, you don't want to say, oh, okay, now I'm really ready to go for it, Lord. No, no, no. Now you go for it. Well, pastor, I'm really trying. I'm really trying. No, no, no. Don't try. Have amazing love for him. If you love him when you can't see him, See, this is why when Jesus said your joy will be full, I don't think it means he'll fill us up from empty to full. I think what he'll do is he'll just top it off. See, because I'm rejoicing already with joy unspeakable, full of glory. And he'll come along and just put the last bit in for what? To spill over. Someday I'll bring you the, the little plate and the cup that I have that you use at Passover and it's a special cup it's just a little silver cup but the edges are all bent and they're rounded and what you do is you fill it up and it sits on the saucer and you fill it up at Passover and you fill it till it flows right over and, and David said my cup runneth over and that's what he was referring to and they pour it and fill it at Passover till it pours over and the, the little saucer is there to catch it and the sides are rounded to catch it see so what happens is our cup is full then he'll top it off and it'll run over that's what happens when you receive something the joy you have when you finally receive it is a little less than the joy you had before you saw it isn't that true Peggy Peggy just got an answer to something she was believing for she stood in faith and she shared with me the dream that was in her heart and God gave her the desire of her heart and she's got it and, and she's so thankful but you know what it's almost anti-climatic really when you think about it because she's already been happy without having seen it so now it's just a little bit more isn't that true Peggy it's kind of like it's almost like ah, finally <laughs> it's not like wow Wow, I feel you good. No, no, no. You know, it's, I already was feeling good even when I couldn't see it. That was a great testimony note that you sent me tonight. I really appreciate it. I rejoiced with you. I rejoiced. Thank God for that. And it just doesn't end. It gets better and better. God's faithful. You, when you don't see, you believe and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's why amazing love is so powerful. You can't believe and have joy unspeakable if you can't love him without seeing him. You see that? This is such a big statement. And then Jesus, man, he just tops it off. He just tops it off. I learned from this that you don't have to see things to rejoice. You don't have to see things to rejoice. You don't have to see it. That's why the Hebrew boys were singing songs in the fiery furnace because the amazing love allowed their amazing faith to work and they were having joy unspeakable full of glory down in the barbecue pit you don't have to see to rejoice just like you don't have to see to believe you don't have to see to rejoice Habakkuk said this though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vine though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy Rina, spin around and shriek in the God of my salvation when you can't see anything why not he said because it's a, such an amazing love that you have for him that things don't determine your joy Peter said whom having not seen you love Though now you don't see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable. Paul would later write, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
in believing. See? The joy comes because of this amazing love and it releases the believing that brings the joy. Saints, you can't work this up. You can't work it up. But it is amazing. I want to close with a scripture. I want you to look at it with me. In John chapter 15, verse 10. John 15, 10. Do you know that the world doesn't have a love like this? They, don't, they sing about you know, love, but they don't have a love like this. What the world needs now it's not the love that we're talking about here they don't have it you know that there are many churches don't have this love going on the people that come come out of route and out of religion and out of habit and that's why many times I think their churches don't experience miracles because there's no amazing faith faith worketh by love John 15 10 if you keep my commandments you'll abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Jesus said, if I can do it, you can do it. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. I want you to see this. When you live for Him, when you live for Him, you have the love of Him living right inside of you. And it releases a joy unspeakable. What happens is, is his joy becomes your joy and then it spills over. His joy becomes your joy. It's like the two meet and kiss. Your joy and his joy. Listen, I obey him because I love him. And when I obey him, his love gets in me and it's my love and his love. See, he talks about both right there. And <laughs> this is so good. My joy will remain in you, and then your joy will become full. Peter said it's joy unspeakable, and it's full. It's full of glory. It's your joy and his joy. It's your love and his love connecting. And, and they meet. You know, this is what's going to happen to us at the rapture. Your love is going to take you up there. And his love is going to meet you there. And the transformation is going to take place. Amazing love. Amazing faith. Amazing joy. You don't get it casually. You get it on purpose. You and I really need this amazing love. We do. Saints, you and I need it. It's something we have to nurture. What you do is you call to mind what you once were. Call to mind where you once were. You know, I love him more since I've come to Woodstock than I've loved him at any other time in my life. And I'll tell you why. Because when I got here, I found myself looking back at all the things that he's done in, in my life to bring me to this moment. And I realize all of the things that I'm not that I thought I was, all the things that I knew that I thought I'd never use, all the things that I wanted to do and I didn't know how to do it, and I find myself a good portion of my prayer life is just telling him uh, I didn't think I could do it I didn't know what you had in store I know who I am I know where I came from I know what I was I know what you made me such a dependency you know it's an amazing love that makes you say God I I believe in the supernatural because I don't see in the natural any way that this could be so. And yet God does it. Jesus said to the woman, or of the woman, this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. I feel a little bit like that woman. I feel like I haven't ceased to kiss his feet since the time I came into Life Church. Jesus is worthy of more time than we're giving him. He's worthy of more time than we're giving him. He's worthy of more time than we're giving him. If you want your love to be amazing, brothers and sisters, you'll have to give him more time. You have to give him more time. I have time restraints and so do you. I have enough work to keep me busy until long after he comes. <laughs> but if we don't give him more time, we won't have more love. You and I will dry up. Our love will become routine. And it's easy when you can't see him because you come to church and you can't tell whether he's pleased. 
You can go through the motions and because you can't see them, you don't know. But your heart will tell you. There are days that I feel like if I don't get alone time with God right away, I don't think I can do another thing. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt like if you don't just get away from everything and spend some time with him, loving him, that you're just going to fall apart? I feel those things. What is that? That's the pull of that amazing supernatural love. If you don't nurture it, you'll become religious. And this church will become a religious church. And we'll all be here, sitting in the same place, doing the same thing, going through the motions, and nothing will happen. It'll be happen for me that way if I don't nurture it, and the same for you. So I exhort you tonight with this word from God that the now that we're living in is a very important time for us as a church to, to develop and nurture our amazing love for Him. Can I just say this by the Spirit of God? Some of you need to stop playing around with issues and go and spend some time with Him. Some of you need to stop trying to discern this and that and this and that and just spend some time with him and just love him for him and develop the amazing love and then you'll know what you need to do and it'll, it'll happen. Some of you are striving for the thing that you can see but you need to just get into the amazing love where you're willing to take hold of something you can't see. Go back to the spiritual Go back to the supernatural. Take hold of something that's invisible and focus on it and give your heart to it. Heavenly Father, you have so wonderfully redeemed Life Church and its people. Father, you have so wonderfully blessed us. We know where we were and we know what you have made us today. Lord, I stand in awe of all that you're planning for this church. It's all doable. We'll see it with our eyes. But until we see, Father, we have this amazing love for you. And we love you, Lord. We do. We love you. How great you are, Lord. Lord, we love you. Lord, with a passion, we love you. Lord, it's not the church. It's not the programs. It's you, Lord. That's who we love. Even though we've never seen you, Lord, we can tell when you're here. We can tell when we haven't fellowshiped you. We can tell when we need you, when we're hungry for you, Lord. Father, thank you for the intangibles, the invisibles. Thank you for the things, the promises that we don't see right now. We rejoice in them as if we had them in our hand, Lord, because they came from you. We love you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Lord, we make a commitment as a church. As a people, Lord, I'm speaking the things that I believe are in the heart of some here tonight to spend more time with you and to just love you, Lord, to romance you with the word, Lord, to let our spirit free to worship you. Lord, we find some time to do that. We don't want to be so busy being blessed with all you've given us that, Lord, we don't know how to stop and thank you for being you to love you, Lord. Lord, we make that commitment to you. Help us to work that out in our life, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's an amazing love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.